Well, good morning or good afternoon or good evening, whenever you're listening. This is Davisville on KDRT-LP, 95.7 FM in Davis, California. We live at KDRT.org online. I'm Bill Buchanan, and I thank you for tuning in. And I welcome you back to our annual movie show with Derek Bang. Yes, even though theaters have been closed in Davis and much of the world for most of the year from the COVID-19 pandemic, we are still talking about movies today. We're certainly still watching them. And the conversation is occurring even if only to find out what has survived the dislocations of the year. Derek writes reviews for the Davis Enterprise and his blog, Derek Bang on Film. Derek, thanks for coming back on Davisville. I want to note this is our 10th annual year-end show. Oh my goodness, has it really been that long? It's been that long. Oh, I look, I look forward to this every fall. We'll do it on a bonus disc at some point and people can listen. <laughs> All and 10 for years. The first, for the first nine years, the format and topics of discussion were pretty much the same. And then yeah, here the, we are at 2020 and all of a sudden everything's up for grabs. Well, that's, and in fact, that's the one of the main themes tonight. And in fact, that may, I should make a programming note. People who've been listening to the show may have noticed that today's show sounds better than they have more recently uh, lately. And in fact, it still had the music in the intro that we normally have. Uh, That's because we're actually recording this in a Davis backyard uh, so that we can do it more or less in person and keep social distance. I've been doing most shows on Zoom lately. Glad to be able to do this one in person. And of course, this being radio, we are leaving you, the listener, the opportunity to envision exactly what this backyard looks like. That's right. And where we're placed within it. Maybe there's a movie in here, Darren. (laughs) Don't know how good it would be, but (laughs) it's an idea. Well, okay, so I schedule this every November, uh, right before the notable year-end movies come out. And there are year-end movies this year, right? Well, that's the question, isn't it? It has been a moving target for the past six months. I could not keep track of the number of major releases that have been pushed back three, four, five times. I suppose one of the earliest and most notorious is the next Bond film, which should have come out in April and then was pushed to June and then was pushed to October. And now it's next April. So what's left? Well, we're not getting anything major theatrically. It's simply not going to happen. The few films that have been trickling into the theaters that are still operational, I hesitate to call them... um, Well, in fact, I won't call them bottom of the barrel because that's not fair, but they are, for the most part, what we used to call B-films. The smaller pictures where there isn't as much of a financial risk running on how many people are going to show up to watch a film in the theater. So for the most part, we all have the at-home options, which have been multiplying rapidly during the same time period, A lot of the films that would have seen theatrical release are now going to streaming platforms, Netflix, Amazon Prime, Disney+, Apple TV+, HBO Max, and Hulu seem to be the six big players. And of course, if you want to have the maximum choice, you'd have to subscribe to all six of them, which is significantly more expensive than it would have been to just pick a theater and go see a movie. You know, and and I have to say here, one reason I like to do this show every year is because I like movies. I've always liked going to movies. And uh, it's maybe an obvious statement to say that, uh, you know, that I miss them. Uh, But I do, and and the convenience is nice at home. But I also find um, it's reduced a lot of movies to sort of a, a, you know, the, the cable TV phenomenon, 500 channels and what do you watch? It's like it's harder for me now, just as a movie watcher, to find the really good movies in the mid all the... Because, you know, in Davis we have theaters, and if something comes to town, it's it's like, okay, it's at the theater. Do you want to go or not? It, you can look at the marquee, and you can immediately yeah. see what's there. It, You're right, because on top of everything else, it has become very difficult to keep track of what is debuting on each of those streaming platforms. So far, the notification system has not caught kept up with the fact that they just get dumped. Yeah, well, and, I, and as a user, as a viewer, um, there's a technological term that came in there. I work in technology for <laughs> my job, and when you talk about users, we really mean customers and such. So anyway, um, as a viewer of movies, it helps me sort to see it at the theater. And then when I see that something's online, I think, well, is that on a channel that I have access to? 
I always had access to the theaters. I could go or not. Uh, you pay your admission, you go in. But, you know, if it's on Disney+, Plus, well, I don't have Disney+. Plus. I really don't want to buy a lot of these other channels. I don't want to spend $8, 9 $10 a month uh, that way. And so that's one more complication. It's a process. Yeah. And the other thing I don't like, which I miss about the big screen theatrical experience, is that at home it is too easy to hit pause when you want to go to the bathroom or get another cup of coffee or another glass of wine or the kids run through the room or the dog does something unspeakable. <laughs> and you keep breaking the experience. Whereas in a theater, you don't have that option. Yeah. You are, quote unquote, trapped, if you will. You are forced to sit there and watch the whole thing start to finish, which obviously is the way that writers and directors and actors intend that you should be watching them. Yeah, and, well, and this makes a job, your job as film critic, really kind of all the more important uh, because uh, your column, your blog, remains one of the markers that I have, um, but film critics in general remain one of the markers that people have to sort of sort through the flood. And I find myself putting a great deal more effort into that process now than I ever used to. Now, talk about that. Well, as I just mentioned, there isn't, it's not like I get a guide once a month that tells me what's coming up on Disney Plus or Amazon or Netflix. Netflix is actually pretty good. They have a website that lists everything that they're going to be releasing for like about the next six weeks. Amazon has no such site. Disney keeps everything secret until it actually debuts. It's very hard. And it's difficult as well reading a brief description because the other thing that's not happening is that the studios are not releasing the same degree of advertising. When's the last time you saw an ad for a movie on, during a TV show? Yeah. Well, I got to admit, uh, this morning I was reading the um, Chronicle and I saw a display ad in there for a movie, um, Hillbilly uh, Elegy. Hill Elegy. <laughs> right. And, but it struck me two things. First, that I was even seeing an ad. And, and the second, I was interested that someone had made a movie out of that. But I thought, I don't know when I last saw a movie ad. And it used to be the most uh, natural thing in the world. Yeah, so the research process has, got, has become more challenging because I definitely don't want to waste time with, and forgive me, those of you who enjoy these kinds of movies, things that are made exclusively for Hallmark and Lifetime. <laughs> because, you know, we're, we're talking about a, a different subset of cinema there. Yeah, well, and I suppose you can say people who like uh, those movies or any particular channel. I mean, if you like something, you start to follow it. You know how to find it. Right. The, the dilemma is how do you find the good thing in a category that you don't, um, don't normally follow? Or a movie from a filmmaker maybe you don't know or something like that. Well, we're in the same territory now as used to be the case with buying music, Right. Yes. You used to be able to walk into a music store and browse through the racks looking for an album or an artist, it, looking for something that you don't know, you don't yet know you're going to like. And it has now become just as hard to do that with movies. Yeah. It's a challenge. So this comes back to your role as a critic. I mean, I, it, it, you, you become all the more important. Your, well, I, your, your I appreciate the thought and I take it seriously and <laughs> I hope the results are worthwhile. Well, okay, so... <laughs> What, uh, well, one of the points I wanted to make, too, you were talking about B-movies are sort of what we're left with this fall. B-movie doesn't necessarily mean bad quality, right? It might no, just not mean at all. It just means uh, less low, expensive. Yeah, low commercial value. But uh, well, So is there anything coming out at the end of the year that, that you're thinking would be, I don't know, good to see? Well, supposedly, still, studios are going to be releasing two big guns on Christmas Day. Now, between you, me, and the wall, I don't think it's going to happen. But as of this moment, as we're taping this show, Wonder Woman 1984 is supposed to open in theaters on Christmas Day. Hmm. And so is News of the World, which is the period Tom Hanks drama. He's a Civil War veteran who assumes the responsibility for bringing a little girl uh, back to her family. Okay, I don't know that movie. Uh, well, I don't really know the first either, except I can tell just from the title roughly what it's about, but... So these are two big movies. They're, they're opening theatrically. Now, as for streaming, uh, there's quite a list. Uh, I just saw Uncle Frank, which is coming to Amazon on November 26th. Uh, Paul Bettany and Sophia Lillis, who was the 
uh, young girl in the two-part It movies. It's a great period story, 1973, uh, about a family, very conservative family in uh, South Carolina, and she has always had a favorite uncle, her uncle Frank, who is nothing like the rest of the clan. He moved to New York City, became a very well-respected teacher at uh, New York University, and of course there's a reason he left and moved to New York City, because in 1973 his lifestyle was not compatible with okay. family values. Great film. Um, Netflix, December 11th, uh, directed David Fincher, is doing a, an intriguing biography of screenwriter Herman J. Mankiewicz. The film's called Mank, and it's about his experience working with Orson Welles, developing what ultimately turned into Citizen Kane. Yeah, I was actually just reading a review of that one this morning, and uh, that's a real movie for film buffs as well. Uh, Definitely. Rose Island, which is popping up on Netflix on December 9th. Now, this is an Italian import, and I can't wait to watch it because it's based on actual events where an idealistic engineer, not that long ago, built his own island off the Italian coast and declared it a sovereign nation. Hmm. And this really happened. Okay. Um, the Prom, Sounds Cute, Netflix on December 11th, Meryl Streep, Nicole Kidman, and a bunch of other people. A group of self-absorbed theater stars swarm into a conservative, small Indiana town to support a high school girl who wants to bring her girlfriend to the prom. Okay. Sounds like it has potential. Uh, Ma Rainey's Black Bottom, Netflix on December 18th. I mean, play by August Wilson. Yeah. Starring Chadwick Boseman and Viola Davis, I Need Say No More. And then, I'm really looking forward to this one, The Midnight Sky, Netflix on December 23rd, George Clooney's next movie. This is a post-apocalyptic tale. Something devastatingly awful has just happened everywhere on Earth. And he's a scientist who has survived in the Arctic. And he is desperately trying to warn some astronauts who are returning from space not to land on Earth. Hmm. So these sound like pretty substantial movies. They are. That's my point. Uh, the the B films are taking the risk with the theatrical exposure, but the really the big guns, the good ones, they're streaming because that's the only way they're really going to get seen to the degree that they deserve. Yeah. We're talking with Derek Bang, Davis film critic. Uh, I'm Bill Buchanan, and this is Davisville on KDRT. LP, 95.7 FM in Davis, California, and our subject today is our annual movie show with Derek. Um, so, I'm a little puzzled that those two still plan to release in theaters, because, I mean, the... the it's not going to happen. Okay, yeah. <laughs> it's just, it's not going to happen. So, that's, that's just a vestige then. I mean, at one point, releasing right at Christmas or Christmas Eve, that would be the big time to release oh, a big Oh, I movie. know. In fact, every year, it was something of a crisis because you'd get anywhere from 8 to 13 massive releases between December 15th and about December 25th. And some of them would not catch because there were just too many to be seen at one time. That's the other nice thing, I guess, or one of the nice things about the streaming option. Things don't disappear. Mm -hmm. they're evergreens. Now, a lot of movies, particularly major releases from major studios, if they don't perform in the first 14 days, they're yanked and they're gone. Now, that doesn't happen with streaming channels, and that's nice because also from my standpoint as a critic, I no longer have to worry about getting a review in the same day that a film opens in order for the commentary to be relevant. Yeah, that's true. All those... The whole idea of a release date is really sort of blurred now. Uh, back to like what you were talking about with music earlier. I mean, there was a day that, you know, Let It Be by the Beatles came out, but you could buy it a month later and it wasn't going to be any problem. Right. It's still the same album. Still the same album and just as available. Um, so when's the last time you were in a movie theater? Oh, my goodness. That's a very good February. Yeah. Because you used to go to advanced screenings, right? But I'm assuming those are... Oh, no, they're gone. Uh, the, yeah, it would have been late February because, um, and I just looked this up 
the other day, uh, there was a recent remake of Jane Austen's Emma, which was the first movie that had already been publicized and was supposed to open in early March that didn't. And it only just now finally appeared on HBO. So hmm. that's, that's kind of how I clock it going back. There would have been an opportunity when Tenet came out. Um, mm -hmm. Christopher Nolan and Warner Brothers were very stubborn about that one, and they insisted that, it, A, it be released in theaters, and, B, that anybody who wanted to review it had to go watch it in a theater. In other words, they did not provide critics with the opportunity to watch it at home. And pretty much all of the critics across the country, myself included, rebelled and said, sorry, but no, I'm not going to risk my life to review your movie. Thank you very much. It seems like an odd thing to get stubborn about in the middle of a pandemic. Well, and it failed. Yeah. You know, it, it was a multi, multi hundred million dollar splashy extravaganza, and it just went nowhere because even though th some theaters were open at that point in time, this was actually six, seven, eight weeks ago, I think, obviously there were enough smart people across the country who just didn't go. Yeah. And, of course, it's been a different experience. I, best I can tell, the, the theaters in Davis haven't been open since the spring. I know no. that in, in other parts of the country, some have opened and stayed open, and uh, sometimes with restrictions and things well, like that. Well, except, uh, of course, the two, we have three theaters. We have the Varsity, which is the Indy, and then the other two houses are Regal Theaters. And, of course, the entire Regal chain closed a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Everywhere. Uh, suspended, I suppose we should say, right? They intend uh, to come Suspended, back. yes. Yeah. Um, Hollywood's still making movies, though, right? I mean, they're still able to make them under these conditions? Uh, all the movies you mentioned uh, that are coming out soon, were they already made, or did they finish them this year? I uh, generally, particularly with bigger releases, you figure the principal shooting took place about a year prior to release. There's always a lot of time spent in post-editing, music, you know, all, all the fiddly bits, the fine-tuning. And, of course, that can be done during... COVID uh, mm -hmm. restrictions. So I think there's enough product now that's kind of been backed up waiting to be released. But there is going to come a point in time, depending on how long this lasts, either late in 2021 or perhaps early in 2022 when there's no product. Yeah, I wondered about that listening to you. Uh, it, it seems like a lag would be coming up because the, the work that wasn't being done well, you could start doing it again, I suppose, once the pandemic eases up, but it won't be ready. Sure. I mean, there's got to be a hole at some point in time. Huh. That's going to be interesting. I, I, <laughs> it's, I mean, it's uncharted territory, right? Yeah. I, everybody's making up the rules as we go along. Yeah. Um, how has the pandemic affected your job? Uh, I know you told me earlier this year you're actually writing more for the Enterprise than you had been. Well, you know, I, I hesitate to call this a silver lining because the cloud in question is so massive and so dark. Yeah. But yes, uh, particularly at the very beginning, when traditional entertainment options completely evaporated, no live theater productions, no live music presentations, no book readings. I mean, you know, you can just tick them all off. Anything that involved being somewhere in person with a lot of other people just vanished. The only thing that was left was me, film criticism. And so suddenly, whereas I had been placing one film review per week every Friday, I was doing two and three, and I was even asked to start doing an occasional series of uh, anthology features talking about, you know, films grouped according to a certain category or theme or, or interest. Now, more recently, a lot of the different entertainment venues have gotten much more clever and creative about ways of presenting what they do via Zoom or streaming. And so the entertainment section of the paper has been building up again and gotten a little bit better. So now I'm usually back to one a week, but sometimes still two a week. So, okay. But for the first three, four months, um, I was busy. <laughs> 
I should mention, by the way, if you're listening and you hear some uh, background noises here, it's not a special effect. We're actually recording. <laughs> We're recording this in a backyard, and I've just heard conversations over the fences. What, you mean that uh, wasn't a Disney bird? Come on. <laughs> yeah, we'd probably owe royalties if it were. No, I don't know. It was a starling or something, or I don't know, not a starling. I don't know birds, but uh, just a programming note, folks, in case you heard that. Um, you, you know, speaking of categorical movies, I wanted to take the opportunity to ask you if if there are good, I hesitate to even phrase the question, because a good pandemic movie sounds like <laughs> nonsense. Okay, but, okay but, Bill, is this question in good taste? Well, I, I mean it to be, yeah, but because <laughs> because movies do deal with, with everything, right? That's part of their strength, is that they, they, they reflect the broad human experience, at least ideally they do. And obviously, uh, this is a major one. I'm not talking about a movie made about the current pandemic. I mean, that would be kind of fast, but we've run into this before, or things that sort of metaphorically are similar. Actually, I was ready for this question. I had a feeling you might ask it, and I was frankly surprised at the number (laughs) of good uh, pandemic movies, shall we call them, that have been made over the years. Uh, one of the very early ones, I was surprised it went back this far, 1950, Panic in the Streets, with hmm. Richard Widmark as a police officer who has 48 hours to catch an escaped convict who unknowingly is infected with pneumatic plague. Uh. And it was it's quite a nail-biter, and it holds up pretty well to this day. Um, 1971's The Andromeda Strain, well, of that, course. That's the one I thought of. Uh, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing that as a kid. Um And then uh, Richard Matheson wrote a novel called I Am Legend, which has actually been filmed three times. And it's about a post-apocalyptic pandemic that turns everybody into nighttime quasi-vampires, I guess. And it was made in 64 with Vincent Price as the last man on Earth. And then Charlton Heston did it in 1971 as the Omega Man. And then more recently, we had Will Smith finally doing it under the book's actual title, I Am Legend. Uh, 12 Monkeys, 1995, with Bruce Willis. Excellent time travel plague story. Contagion is the one that's been (laughs) racing off the shelves, 2011. Children of Men, that was a good one. Oh, I don't know that one at all. The plague that renders women infertile. Oh, yes. Uh, And then if you want horror plague, you know, the zombie apocalypse, we have 28 Days Later and World War Z. So there's no shortage (laughs) So there's probably uh, uh, an article in there about why <laughs> why we come back to this theme. Um, well, I mean, it is rooted in reality, not, not the details of what you're talking about, but I mean, this sense of dislocation. And the, the one on that list that I recall most vividly that I've seen was the Andromeda Man. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Andromeda Strain. Andromeda Strain. I did see that, but Omega Man with Charlton Heston, right? Right. Mm-hmm. And I think it's set in L.A., and he lives in a compound that he's got all rigged up with lights and all that. And in the daytime, he goes out and watches movies, I think, part of the time. When he's not killing yeah. the uh, daytime vampires. And, of course, the, the buzz on that story is that it turns out halfway through that some of the people that he has been killing are infected but not dangerous and so to them he's the enemy yes um by way of thinking they're the evolved humanity i suppose right 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 they're the survivors who are nonetheless infected but not dangerous to anybody else as opposed to the ones that keep coming after yeah see and this is part of what makes movies so interesting to me as i mean they can be entertaining they can be diverting uh i i will admit i have a real affection for 1950s science fiction movies that are no one's idea of, uh, you know, uh, smart, <laughs> smart time well spent, but uh, but the diverting. But then you get these movies, even something like that, that you know was a, a a big movie in its day, but it's also trying to be kind of thoughtful. Well, social commentary is yeah. never very far, particularly when you're talking about science fiction. Good science fiction is always about social commentary. It's a way of examining today's problems through a lens that kind of tricks you into assuming that they're not talking about today's problems. Mm-hmm. Rod Serling was always famous for that with the Twilight Zone episodes back in the day. And as technology continues to evolve, I can only imagine uh, how movies might be able to take advantage of that. Uh, you know, stuff that 
I can't even imagine now. You know, I, I'm thinking back to was it William Castle in the 50s had those weird special effects, you know, like... Uh, oh, the Tingler. The Tingler and, you know... Uh, Skeletors. I, yes, I and, made that part up. But, and you well, know. The, the fright break was a good one. If you left during the last uh, five minutes of the movie, they'd refund your money, which, of course, didn't work after the first week because back in those days, you could see something twice just by staying in the theater. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I recall seeing a couple of movies where they handed you fright insurance and said if you were to die. That was your, another one. Yeah. $1,000 would go to your next kin. Uh, I'm thinking of something perhaps, you know, um, that will be more, you know, Adventuresome. I don't know what it will be, but, but well, I, I suspect in the next decade we're going to start seeing a lot of movies about cloning. Yeah, and artificial intelligence probably, and that too. What's the line between humanity and um, machine? Well, we've already seen that, but I have a hunch we're about to see a lot more nuance in that mm-hmm. in real life. Definitely, and movies will probably reflect that. Um, all right, just at the very near end, just real quick summary. This has been a weird year. For movies, oh, gee. but uh, adjusting for that, whatever that means, uh, has it been a good year, bad year, mediocre year overall? For movies? Um, it, you know, I I have to. I'm going to take. I'm going to cop out on that one and say incomplete. Yeah, I don't think it's fair to judge 2020's roster of films. And you know, between you me and the wall, I have no idea how the MPAA is going to mount the Academy Awards. Yeah, that'll be one of the first year. things to look at in 2021. I actually read one idea that said maybe don't even do it this year. Let, let people sort of rediscover the reason why we do it or rethink the way. Well, it would be more fair to everybody concerned if they did skip a year and looked back on a 24-month period yeah. to allow exposure to a lot of the stuff that didn't get to come out when it was supposed to. Well, Derek, thanks for coming back on Davisville for show number 10 about movies. Well... You're very welcome, and I look forward to doing this again 12 months from now when, right, everything is back to normal. I'm sure it will be by then, Derek. (laughs) How could it not be? I'm Bill Buchanan. This is Davisville on KDRT. Thanks for listening. We're going to go out with a song by Vince Guaraldi, Thanksgiving theme. You should recognize it.